So there it is, the theme of the conference. In some ways, I don't really need to say more, but I have more to say. So I want to tell you two very brief stories that are UK-based. The first one was, um, takes place in 1986. And uh, I was on sabbatical from my job at New York University. And I was in a very um, transitional moment in my life. My father had just died. I'd been working very, very hard. I just had finished my first drama therapy textbook. And I was very, very tired. And I decided to base my six-month sabbatical in London. And I planned it to be very spontaneous. I would just sort of show up, see what happens. I bought an open ticket on the British Railway, and I planned to just not plan, just to see where the moment would take me. And I arrived in London one day feeling very, um, very lonely, very sad. And I didn't know where I was going to go. And I went to the, I arrived at, I think it was Victoria Station. And I asked somebody, do you suggest a place to stay? And somebody said, yeah, this is B&B someplace in a neighborhood I never heard of. And so I said, fine. And I got on the subway, and I went out. I took, I don't know, three trains. And I got out, and I found this little place. And it was at the top of the stairway, three floors up. And I dropped my bags, and I think I fell asleep. And I woke up, and I knew that that night I wanted to go to, to the National Theater to see a very special performance of Les Liaisons d'Angelis. And um, I knew it was, a, it was a big hit in London, and I didn't know if I could get tickets, but I went. And I, you know, someone told me, you take this subway and this subway and this subway, and I got there, and I was told that the performance was all sold out and I couldn't get in. And I was very insistent, and somebody appeared, some very nice person appeared, and said, listen, I have an extra ticket. I said, great. And at the end of the performance, which was wonderful, it was very late, and I was very, very tired, not only jet-lagged, but I was bone-weary. And um, I thought, OK, time to go to bed. And I thought, gee, I don't remember which train I got on. I don't remember where the B&B &B was. I had a key. But there was no name on it, because there was no hotel. It was just a key. And all my things, everything I had with me, all my clothing and money and passport, was all in this hotel room, and I had no, no idea where it was. So I thought, OK, let's see what happens. So I jumped on a, the nearest tube, and it went. And I went on another one and got off someplace. And I looked around, and I didn't recognize anything. And by this time, it was about 12 o'clock. It was about midnight. And I began to wander. And I thought, well, I'll come across it. I must be in the right neighborhood. <laughs> and I walked, and I walked for about three hours. And nothing, nothing looked familiar. And I realized at the end of the three hours, I was deeply lost, deeply sad, deeply alone, and there was nothing I could do. So in front of me was a, was a green, a little park. And I just sat there and began to sob. I didn't know what else to do. And I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I sobbed. I wiped my eyes, and I looked up, and there was the B&B &B right in front of me. <laughs> I had been going around in circles for three hours. That's my first circle story. <laughs> Second one is three days ago. I arrived on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. And I went to photograph the Callanish Standing Stones, the Circle of Stones, uh, that my dear friend Alita had uh, told me about. And I um, checked it out on the internet, and I was very excited to go there. And I rented a car, and I got off the plane. And again, I was feeling tired and, I won't say lost, but not quite embodied. And I got in the car. And as I was driving out again, I, I hadn't driven a car on the left-hand side of the road since 1986. And I was feeling a little off balance. And I got out, of, so, and I had a GPS, and the, the, the woman on the, on the computer said to me, go to the, go to the turnaround, turnaround, circle? 
uh, roundabout, go to the roundabout and take the second exit. Now, in my mind, a roundabout goes counterclockwise. <laughs> And I had to say, okay, now this is, this is clockwise, the way of the clock, which seems to make a lot of sense, but I'm a lefty, so I always go against the clock, and it seemed to make perfect sense to me. So I went into the roundabout and got completely confused, and I had no idea what the second exit meant. It meant nothing to me. And I just got totally lost, and I veered off someplace, and my tire hit the side of the, the road on the curb and <laughs> exploded. So I called up the rental place, and I said, listen, I, I saw you about five minutes ago. But... And they said, OK, you have to go to this place to, to change the tire, and it's here, and you have to make a left and a right and a left. I said, listen, I'm exhausted. I don't know what you're talking about. You probably are sending me to another roundabout. I'm going to get lost. Can you come and please take care? No, you have to go there. I said, OK. I said, and furthermore, the tire is 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 destroyed. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to mess up the whole wheel, the whole um what do you call it? The uh the rim. And he said, "No, this is what you So I did it. I I I found my way. And the people were very nice and they said, "Oh, this happens all the time to, to Yanks." You know. <laughs> and I said, "Great." And he said, "You know, you're lucky you didn't blow out two tires because most people blow blow out two tires as soon as they get off the the, the plane." I said, "Yeah, I guess I'm lucky." So we did this, and I, the, the woman in the, in the place said, now look, you've got to go to the office, which is near the ferry station, in a different place where you were before, because you have to sign some documents. And I said, you know, I really would like to go on my way. No, no, you have to do this. It's simple. You just go through the roundabout. <laughs> it's right up in, you don't even have to, just go through the roundabout. It's right there. So I went to the roundabout, and I was very, I didn't know what through meant. Does it mean counter? Does it mean clockwise? Does it mean straight? Does it mean through? I had no idea. So I got totally messed up on that roundabout. The cars are coming in either direction, and I'm really getting very, very nervous. So I veered off someplace, and I went to a, you know, a side road. I missed the, the, the car place. And again, my tire hit the side of the road, and another tire blew. So as before, when I was in London in 1986, I just pulled to the side of the road, and I began to, to sob. I just felt, I, I can't do this. This is impossible. I shouldn't be doing this. I didn't want to rent the bloody car in the first place. <laughs> So, I don't know, somehow I was driving around and people were yelling at me and they said, hey buddy, your car is all blown out, you can't drive. I said, I know, I know, I'm like, so some guy appeared and pulled me over and he said, yeah, it's pretty bad. He said, you know, you're going to have to pay, you know, a million pounds and, and you know, we're going to take you to jail. And, and he said, and the worst thing he said, and furthermore, you can no longer have a car from us and we're the only, we're the only rental place in town. I said, what do you mean? My place is a little village, you know, an hour away. Said, no, you had, two, you had two accidents. That's it. I said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, well, you're, you're on your own. He said, you could take a bus, but, you know, they, they run every three hours. And he, so he threw a bus schedule at me, and he, he disappeared. I thought, geez, you know. So I got on the bus at some point later and, you know, eventually wound up at this old fisherman, in a, fisher, in a little village, in a fisherman's house where I was staying. And the woman of the house was a guide. She was an angel. And she took care of me, and everything was fine. And she took me right away to the stones. And it was, it was, a, it was a, just a, a beautiful moment, not only to be with the stones, but to be with these people. And the man went fishing in, early in the day, and he caught the fish, and I had it at dinner time. It was great. So I was thinking about circles as I do most days, these days. And I was thinking that the circle has brought me back to the UK after many years. And um, I'm still trying to negotiate a circle and understand how, how to be in a circle, how to be around a circle, how to negotiate a circle, how to drive through or around or inside of a circle, and how to hold myself in a circle, and the biggest question, will I be held once I am there? 
And so I bring that story, those two stories to you, uh, in starting this, this presentation. And to tell you that, like this amazing puppetry uh, presentation, this is a story about, it's about circles, it's about snakes, and it's about cells, and it's also about this notion of alchemy. And how can alchemy somehow illuminate the process of drama therapy? And you know, uh, as one of the, one of the main volumes of Carl Jung's collected works is called Alchemy and Psychoanalysis, which is absolutely profound. And I used to, I remember years ago, you know, I've studied Jung off and on for 40 years or so or more. And, uh, at one point I was in analysis with, with an older man in the U.S who was analyzed by Jung. So I'm sort of one generation right behind uh, uh, Carl Jung. And I've been away from him for a while, but in preparation for this, um, this talk, I wound up engaging very deeply in the Red Book. So the Red Book sat on my table. It took up the whole table. It's a giant book. I don't know if you know it. Do you know the Red Book? It's big, and it's very, very heavy. And it's extremely dense. It's almost unreadable and unseeable. It's just full. Jung considered this his, his magnum opus, his main, his main work. And everything else he did from his point of view came from the Red Book. And the Red Book is basically a dream journal. It's conversations with God and various prophets. It's very, very esoteric. And it's written in a style of an, of, of an ancient medieval illuminated manuscript and you'll see you'll see some of the things because a lot of a lot of the preparation for this talk is around Jung's work in the Red Book. He wrote it over 16 years and he only shared it with very 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 close friends and colleagues and after he died he lo his, his heirs locked it in a safe for I don't know 30 years after he died and it just came out about I don't know, about 15 years ago or something like that. So um, I ask, I ask your indulgence. I'm going to ask you to uh, participate very much with me in this presentation. I'm going to ask you to read, to perform, to do all kinds of things. And I hope you're open to that. I've asked a couple of people who I met along the way to engage, and some of you I'll ask in the moment if that's okay. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine. You just say no and pass it on to somebody else. Uh, so shall we? Shall we dig in? So. The theme of the conference is, it's complex, but it has something to do with coming back to self. Uh, you know, that circular Ouroboros image, um, of which I've, I've engaged, I'd say, with a thousand and one Ouroboros, <laughs> Ouroboroses, over the last couple of months. And it's been a delight and, and um, a little bit um, crazy making in a way, because when I first shared with my very dear friend, Alita Gersey, that I was, you know, digging into um, midi medieval alchemy and so forth. She said, she said, be very careful. You're going into some dark places. And I had no idea what she was talking about. Now I know. So here we go. And you can finish up your drawing, and here's an, uh, an old painting. The original idea of alchemy, the chemical part of the meaning of alchemy, 
was to transform base metals into silver or gold. So here you see an old alchemist over his learned books, his, his um, you know, five books of Moses or whatever, transforming metal into gold, and the gold is shining. And so you can learn a little bit about, you can learn just a wee bit about alchemy coming up. So here it is. Um, just a little bit, because uh, alchemy is kind of complex. So you have basically three primes, three prime substances, sulfur, mercury, and salt. Mercury is the big one, because mercury does that. And if you think of mercury, it's a uh, solid and a liquid at the same time, and it brings about transformation. So look at the image of mercury. You're going to see it on a lot of the images that, that come, come next. Right? It looks like, uh, you know, male-female imagery. So the four elements, you have earth, water, air, and fire, all of which are tri triangles, some inverted. And you'll see in many of the images that the triangle has six points. So obviously it's, you know, air and fire put together, or earth and water put together. The seven primary metals. The most important I'm going to draw your attention to are the, uh, the, the metals of gold and silver. And most alchemical imagery has uh, an image of silver and gold. Gold is the sun, and gold is the male principle. Silver is the moon, and silver is the female principle. The female principle is dark, the male principle is light. Just for you to know. Um, and then you have seven operations of transformation, which I'm not even going to go into now, other than you, you should know that there was a whole system of transforming one metal into the other. And we begin with the notion of transforming metals. And metaphorically, the system is about a philosophical, psychological, psychic transformation of souls. So, so you hear, here you see the sun and the moon, the male principle, the female principle, the light and the dark. And in the center, of course, is a circle. And in the circle is a triangle, a square, and a circle. The triangle, square, and the circle is, is an image of the philosopher's stone. And for an alchemist, the philosopher's stone was the primary substance from which all life derives, the source of all life. And with that substance, an alchemist can carry on the transformation. And from a philosophical point of view, with the Philosopher's Stone, we can heal the sick. We can, I shouldn't say we, I'm not an alchemist. Maybe I am. <laughs> Maybe we all are. Uh, can carry on any kind of critical transformation of the soul, the spirit, the psyche. Remember that image of the triangle, square, and circle. So it's a circle and a square within the triangle, within the circle. Now, how many of you have ever seen um, the Disney um, Fantasia? And in Fantasia is one piece, which was always my favorite when I was a little kid, and I've seen it since, called The Sorcerer's Apprentice, right? About this wild sorcerer who wore a big, big hat with the sun and the moon on it, by the way. And he you know, had all these magical powers. And when he's gone, Mickey Mouse takes over and tries to do the powers and, and, and causes havoc until the alchemist comes back and makes everything right again. So the interesting thing, you look at Mickey's hat, you know, the, the, the moon and the stars. The Sorcerer's Apprentice is a story about an alchemist. And the fact that an alchemist can keep the entire universe in check. And when the alchemist is gone, the sorcerer, the, the apprentice, is in no way prepared to control the chaos of the universe. The goal, one major goal of alchemy is creation. 
And this is an image, this is a medieval image, the homunculus, the idea of the fully formed human or animal within a jar, within a, uh, a, jar a test tube. Sound familiar? I mean, we're now, you know, we can, we can create life outside of, the, outside of the human body. And this idea was around a long, long time. And again, you see, and alchemy is also very much about integration. It's about uh, two principles finding a connection. And you see the integrating part is, is a snake-like, serpent-like creature that holds together the male and the female. Another goal, a very similar goal, again holding to two principles of male and female, sun and moon, is wholeness. The integration of opposites, the holding together of opposites, which is the ultimate transformation. Actually, I make a distinction and if you think about it trauma therapeutically, I make a distinction between transformation, and you know there's a whole uh, theory practice of drama therapy, you know this, called developmental transformations, where the idea is that uh, life and, and, and human existence is uh, constantly in flux, and that the way to deal with the, the, uh, the fluidity of existence is to help people find a way to transform from one state of being to another, from one role to another, so forth. Uh, the idea here is that the ultimate goal isn't transformation, it's wholeness, it's, it, it's, um, it's integration. Being able to hold the contradictions of existence within one system, within one body. I showed that already, creation, wholeness. The obstacle, the thing that stands in the way for the alchemist reaching his or her goals is destruction, which brings us back to the theme of our conference, destruction and creation. And a lot of the, al the, the ancient al alchemical images are brutal, and uh, they're, they're about brutality and destruction, one creature destroying another. You'll see more of that later. And here we have the sun being devoured, the bloody sun. The guides, I'm going to talk to you about a system of guides and destruction and so forth later, but the, the two main guides are Hermes and Mercury. And these are two ancient texts, and again you see the Hermetic text, you see Hermes holding together the sun and the moon, and you see Mercury holding the two uh, images, the caduceus, you know, the staff with the, the two snakes and twine, and uh, holding off the two principles of male and female, or integrating the two principles. All right. Five, I need five, five voices. I'm just going to call you out. If, if you don't feel like reading, that's fine. Just pass it on to somebody else. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, would you like to begin, please? And, and just project, nice and loud. Oh, this is the praxis, chemical and spiritual. This is the way the alchemist works. Please. Number one, take a common rainwater with one tea seal in glass bottle for at least 10 days, then it will deposit matter at 50 degrees. There it is, the creation, the alchemical creation. These are very, very old graphics from uh, ancient texts, medieval texts.
And you can see there's, there's a lot of imagery in these, and I'm, I can't even begin to explain them. I, I'm just asking you to see what you can see. Just indulge with whatever you can in the imagery. It's powerful. Now, generally in drama therapy, we don't necessarily draw an image of drama therapy. We might embody an, in, an image of drama therapy. So if I can invite, David, where are you? David, come on up. And Anna, come up. Just, how about in front, of the, in front of the cauldrons? And if I ask you, just in the moment, you're two brilliant improvisers. Create an image of drama therapy. Together. Hold that. Take a nice deep breath. Let it go. Let it go. Thank you very much. Please have a seat. Thank you. So I've been doing drama therapy for a long time, and I became aware of two critical parts of the, you know, the elixir, the alchemical elixir of drama therapy. Two parts. Now these two, these are my photographs, these two images. So there was a time years ago when I was first learning photography that I was working in theater with masks. And so whenever anybody stepped foot in my home or my circle of space, I would force them, I would force them to wear a mask. I would invite them. I wouldn't force them. But, you know, very few people said no. And I, one, one mask that I use very often was the clown mask. And this, this guy happens to be one of the most famous living poets in the English-speaking world. His name is Billy Collins. And at the time, he was just a poker player in my living room. Um, so that's the clown mask. On the, on the left-hand side, this is a, a, a mask that I made on my, my face. So this is a mask of myself at a much earlier age. And I would put this mask on, as you see, on children, on old people, um, on women, on you know, any, anybody who was not me. And the idea was, at the time, was to explore notions of, you know, answer the question, who am I? What kind of roles, if I took my face and put it on another body, 
Who was I then, and how could I see myself uh, on or in another body? Role. And then story. And side by side, you see an illuminated manuscript from, I believe, the 15th century of the Odyssey in ancient Greek. Can anybody read that? Uh, you know, I know there's some Greek speakers here. I don't know if you can read it. It's ancient Greek. It might be difficult. Um, and side by side is an image from the Red Book, which was also, as I, I said to you before, created as a, um, um, a medieval illuminated manuscript. So you see how similar they are. Now, Jung, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but Jung was a very, very accomplished painter. As much as he was a philosopher, psychologist, a very, very accomplished painting. A painting was probably his first, his first um, I would say first art, but perhaps first location. OK, uh, Rula, are you here? Rula, would you read, uh, hang on a second, number one uh, from the Odyssey. Alida, would you read number two? from the Blackfoot tribe. Uh, King James Bible, I don't know. Um, Richard, where are you, Richard? Richard Horm. Richard? OK, so would you read number three? And then uh, Anna, again, Anna, would you read number four, please? Whenever you're ready. Rula? Hang on a second. I just want to make sure everybody's heard. So if you, if you um, articulate well, and I'm going to stand closer by you so my microphone could pick up your, your voice. Number two. One day, an old man decided that he would make a woman and So he formed the book. Number three. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And number four. Mr. and Mrs. Bursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious. Yes, it's very, very interesting. interesting. I forgot that the first Harry Potter book was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I didn't even know what a Philosopher's Stone was when I was reading that book to my children a long time ago. So, something very interesting. As I was developing role theory, I became, began to see the relationship of role and its counterpart, which I called counter-role. Uh, male, and female, male and female, sun and moon, precious, precious and despised, as, um, as taking place in a, um, in a space where there was distance between one role and the other, where there was a kind of transitional space between the two. That is, as you, as you see in the famous Michelangelo painting, um, I'm sure you all know this, this is very famous, and, and as you can see, and I, you know, you, I'm sure you probably knew this, but maybe, maybe you didn't think about it, between the finger of God and Adam is a space. And that seems to me to make all the difference in the world and to be profoundly important for drama therapy. This is Brooklyn Bridge, nearby where I live. It's very close. Maria lives in Brooklyn. How many other people here live in, have ever lived in Brooklyn? Anybody? So here's the Brooklyn Bridge uh, in its infancy. So the space was a bridge between two shores, touching each but apart from both. I called it the guide. So from two parts, from one role and its counter role, from role and counter role, came three. Role, counter role, and guide. I'm talking about role theory that I developed over, I don't know, 30, 30 some odd years.
¿no? You don't want to go past the guy. There we go. So, in role theory, a healthy personality is defined as one who is able to live among the contradictory parts, the contradictory roles between role and counter role, mediated by guys. That's in the in role theory. That's pretty much the definition of a healthy personality: in the contradictory roles as mediated by guide and is told and is expressed, the roles are expressed through story. And um, very obscure. Conversations with Philemon, conversations with God, um, wild explorations of dreams. And Jung wrote about his own dreams and he wrote about dreams of his clients told to him by somebody else. So you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of really um, very story called Mysterium Encounter. So I would like to invite uh, Sam to come up on this. And I'm going to invite, so you're, you're going to be, uh, Sam's going to play Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, right? I mean, so it's typecasting, of course. Uh, I want to invite Abi Hadari to come up on this side of the stage. Achieving this state of balance requires heroic journeys played out in stories. And again, if the two parts are role and story, this is how the two parts connect. The healthy personality is one able to live among. And here we come. I chose a story to work, to work with you today from the Red Book. And most of the stories are very, very difficult. They're very dense, complex uh, material. So here's a, here's a painting from Jung in, in uh, illuminated manuscript style. And one still on stage. And this is, this is going to be new text to you. And if you can stand over here. Now, Sam, you, you, there'll be a slide on this, a couple of slides on the screen. And you, I like you. But if you can sheet a little bit this way, but also in a way that you can read the slide. Over here, Avi, on the, can you come on this side? And Avi, you're going to play the role of the prophet Elijah. And I asked Abby, when Abby and I were sitting at lunch, and I said, can you choose somebody to be your daughter who will play the role of Salome? And he chose, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. OK. Can you come up, please, Claire, and stand next to Abby? And you will be Salome. And you'll read the, the part of Salome. There's one other voice in this drama, in this story, that it just has a, a single line, it comes, comes in at the end, a voice from the distance. And I'm going to ask, Maria, can I ask you to read that voice? Um, you don't have to come up, because it should come up out of the, out of the distance. All right, so here we go. So this is a story from the Red Book, and we'll just play it out in, in language. Here we go. And so the, the Jung part is, you know, I, I intended originally to have different people play Jung, but you are the, the uh, I don't know, prototypical Jung in my mind. So can you read one through seven? Read the whole thing, if you don't mind. The whole thing. From one to seven. From one to seven. And there'll be more. Okay. On the night when I encountered the essence, essence of God, I became aware of an image. I lay in a dark depth. An old man stood before me. A black serpent lay at his feet. Some distance away, I saw a house with columns. A beautiful maiden steps out of the door. 
I see that she is blind. The old man waves to me, and I follow him to the house. The serpent creeps behind us. Darkness reigns inside the house. A bright stone lies in the background. As I look into its reflection, the images of Eve, the tree, and the serpent appear to me. After this, I catch the sight of Odysseus and his journey on the high seas. And, and well, you know, this is young Elijah, young Elijah, young Elijah, Salome, and young. Suddenly, a door opens onto a garden full of bright sunshine. We step outside, and the old man says to me, Do you know where you are? I am a stranger here, and everything seems strange to me. Who are you? I am Elijah, and this is my daughter, Salome. The daughter of Herod, the bloodthirsty woman. Why do you judge so? You see that she is blind. My wisdom and my daughter are one. Her blindness to my sight has made us companions through journey. How can I love you? Your hands are stained with the blood of the Holy One. I dread you, you beast. Keeping you up, Elijah is my father, and he knows the deepest mysteries. What will he do for a single look to the infinite unfolding of what is to come? Your temptation is devilish. You, Elijah, who are a prophet, and she, the bloodthirsty horror. You are the symbol of the most extreme contradiction. Doubt tears me apart. Fear seizes me. I rush out. I am surrounded by the black night. I do not love Salome. I fear her. Then the spirit of the depths spoke to me and said, Apart from Elijah and Salome, I found the serpent as a third principle. The serpent taught me the unconditional difference between the two principles in me. The way of life rides like the serpent, from thinking to pleasure, and from pleasure to thinking. Thus, the serpent is a wise bridge. May the thinking person accept his pleasure and the feeling person accept his own thought. They are each other's poison and healing. Do you take a nice deep breath? Let the rolls go and please return to your seats. Thank you very much. So you all know this image. It's supposedly from China. Nobody knows for sure where the image comes from, but it's associated with China around the third century before Christ. And you notice that the yin yang, the yin is the female principle that has a bit of, uh, in, in this case, it's, li it's, it's light, opposite of the sun and the moon. And it has a, uh, a circle of, of, of darkness within it. The yang is the dark, and it has a circle of light in it. And now we come to the Ouroboros. Um, the Ouroboros, one of the earliest images in the Western world of the Ouroboros, the Ouroboros appears in just about every culture, every, almost every traditional culture that I, I, I can think of. I found the Ouroboros image throughout all cultures. 
uh, Native American cultures in, in, uh, in, the, in the US and Canada, um, uh, Eastern cultures, Japan, China, India, and so forth, all around the world. Now this particular image of the Ouroboros was drawn, was appeared on a, on, on a single page of papyrus in the third century AD, so 600 years later. And it was created by a woman uh, thought to be the first alchemist in the Western world. She was called Cleopatra the Alchemist. And uh, she lived initially in Egypt, and then she uh, immigrated to, to Greece. And interestingly, you see, as in the yin-yang, you see a black, a black section with a, uh, a circle of, of white, uh, the eye, and a white section with circles of black. And in the center, in uh, ancient Greek, are three words. One is all. And you also notice that in the Ouroboros image, this very early image, the snake does not have the tail in its mouth. There is a space between the mouth and the tail. I wish I could give you a lot of time to just sit with these images there. I've, I've sat with them for many, many, many hours, and it's actually quite powerful. So this is a, a quotation from, from Carl Jung. Um, Laura, where are you? Oh, we got three lawyer, lawyers. We got three lawyers. Uh, Laura Wood, would you, would you read this, please? A symbol uniting all the opposites. Carl Gustav Jung. And here's an Egyptian uh, image of the Ouroboros, 21st dynasty. I, I don't exactly know when in time that is, but it's a long time ago. In fact, um, as part of my research for this, I, I went to the uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York and I spent time, and it has a quite an amazing Egyptian collection, just photographing images of snake, the snake and the Ouroboros on the old uh, sarcophagi. Sargophagi. Is that right? Sargophagi. And the old tombs, and they're all over the place in the, in the Met Museum. So here's one. Eighteenth century, and the the snake and the dragon, the serpent, are one and the same as an image, especially medieval times and pre medieval times. And these are the crowned, the crowned dragons, the crowned serpents, and in the corners are the four elements that you saw in the alch alchemical chart earlier. This one is, I find, uh, particularly beautiful. And uh, I don't know what the text is. It's in ancient Greek. And it's, it's, a, it's a serpent. And this time you see the tail is in the mouth. There's no space. So here you see um, another cultural representative of the Ouroboros. I can't tell you what language that's, that's in. My, my hunch is... Uh, uh, Southeast Asia, a Southeast Asian culture. It could be Cambodia or Laos. And you see again, this time, uh, an image of the Philosopher's Stone, right? You, although this time the triangle is within the circle. 
And there's a lot of uh, variation in how the images are drawn. And this one is more of a Christian uh, image. And a lot of times you see with the Ouroboros image and the alchemical image, as they become more later in the, or in the medieval times forward, a lot of them are combined with images of Christianity. All right, now I, I asked two people to, uh, to join me to come up and, and do a little improvisation. Could you both please come up? And one of you is going to be, and you can do this right in front of the, the cauldrons. One of you is to be, uh, one of you will take on the role of the Ouroboros. Who, who's going to be the Ouroboros? You'll be the Ouroboros. Okay, could, could Stacia, is that right? Yeah. Stacy, could you help him into role of Ouroboros? And when he's there, you're simply going to ask the question, why do you eat your tail? And you will respond in movement, in words, in words and movement, whatever you want to do. Just very brief, a minute or two. OK, please. Nice deep breath. Let the rolls go. Thank you very much. <laughs> so here we go, another image. And this time, there's a transitional space between the mouth and the tail. And we have a sun in the center. Um, can I have another voice, somebody? Would somebody like to read a hand? Please. And, and loud, please. Thank you. Okay. We saw that, didn't we? No. Oh, we did not. Okay. This is a 16th century drawing. I'm going to move a little quicker. Another voice? A hand, please? Please. Loud? Caduceus. And here we have Mercurius, Mercury, and a very, very old manuscript page of the Caduceus. Mercury is holding the Caduceus. Another voice? Please? 
Did, did we, we have, have did we? Yeah. Oh, we, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I'm going to move a little quicker. Uh, another, another voice, please. Please. And back, loud, nice and loud. A palm whose labyrinth twists and turns are not lacking in terrors. Beautiful. And here are some of the terrors. I'm going to move a little quicker because we're about to run out of time. The terrors. So at some point in 2014, um, I, I stopped writing. You know, I was, I, I, I've written a lot in my, in my professional life, and I, I needed to stop writing. I had, I had um, uh, become tired of words. And so I began to make circle. I didn't know why. And when I say make them, I created them. I drew them on pictures. I did them at photographs and photoshops. And, this began to make a lot of circle. I saw circles everywhere, in the street, in my wallet. E pluribus unum. <laughs> in the sky. That's a created image, that's not a real one. On top of building, in my kitchen, in the elevator, in museums and houses of worship. One day I shared my images with a friend who asked, why are you making these circles? I answered, I don't know. She replied, I think you're trying to find a center the wholeness in your life. That is why Jung made mandalas. I'm going to skip through this quickly. But the idea is that the mandala is a central point within the psyche to which everything is related, by which everything is arranged, and which is itself a source of energy. A center! A center! Ah! A center. OK, here we go. See if you can recognize these, these images. Self. You know what that is? Hal. 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's a famous New York. I'm not going to go into this. This is uh, from, I'm going to skip over this poem from Yeats. But Yeats says, most importantly, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So, at the cent for, for Jung, at the center of the personality was the self. Remember the one is all, or two is all, or three, or four. And this brings us, as we near, we, we near the close of this talk, to the notion of quaternity, which was the ultimate configuration for Jung. The circle has four points. Wholeness is quaternity. Jung said, all things do not live in three, but in the four they marry be. Here they are. Intuition, sensation, feeling, and thinking. Ancient mathematicians believed that to square the circle, that is to conceive of a formula to reconcile the area of the circle and the square, um, the, the attempt was futile. It was impossible. And this is my version of trying to square the circle. And as you know, that Leonardo da Vinci created the Vitruvian Man. Whoops. That's a very famous image of the man within the square, within the circle, with writing from Vitruvius, who was a uh, Roman architect who believed that the dimensions of buildings was equivalent to the dimensions in the body. And I discovered that the sketch was a self-portrait, so I placed myself in the circle and the square, and I found 
my own text. It brought me back to writing. I'm not even going to tell you about this now. You can ask me later. And I wondered, as Vitruvian man, who am I? What am I reaching for? Am I reaching backward or forward? What is stopping me from getting there? And who can guide me? And this brings me to the alchemy of drama therapy. Four figures, hero, destination, guide, obstacle, and guide. The hero asks, who am I? I am Vitruvian man, woman on a journey. The hero asks, what do I want? I want to square the circle to find a home, to be whole and open-hearted. The hero asks, what is stopping me from getting there? My obstacles include the limitations of my limbs, my nakedness, the limitations of my creativity and wisdom, my fear of failure, and above all, my awareness of time passing and the profound challenge of living every moment in the present. Here we go. The hero asks, who can help me? My guides, the artist Leonardo, the mystic psychotherapist philosopher Jung, and the Ouroboros, the snake circle that holds all contradictions without requiring resolution, simply integration. And there he is, or she. In the happy end of the story, the hero returns home, the first man and woman leave the garden, the circle is squared, the cold heart and rigid mind are warm and flexible and integrated, the earth is temperate, God is in his heaven, and all is right with the world. At the same time, the shadow and the snake the despot, the bigot, and the warmonger, holding their darker purposes, are acknowledged and given their place at the table. There is a reversal of selves. The one self is not all. The all is one and is all. So I discovered in meeting a Sufi master that a circle is never complete from a Sufi point of view. And I drew this, and it changed my life forever. My friend asked me when I returned home, again, why do I make circles? Uh, or I asked, why do I make circles? And she said, you make circles because you're trying to hold the broken pieces of your life together. Whoops. Going too fast. I'm sorry. Going a little too fast. Hang on a second. There's one more thing I have to have you do before you go. And let me find it. OK. Um, can I ask everybody to stand, please? Suspend your disbelief and please stand. And I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes and to reach out. Reach out in front of you. And reach with your eyes closed. Reach out for a circle and hold it gently and bring it into your body. Find the circle, bring it into your body. Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, and hold it there. And now, reach out again for a snake. And hold it gently, and bring it to your body. And once more, reach out for a self. Hold it gently, and bring it to your body. And now please open your eyes. Let it go. Let, it, let your arms go. Let it all go. Let it go. And I want you to make a circle in the room. And leaving a space in the circle. Just with everybody. Find a way to make a circle, but not a closed circle, an open circle. Find a place for yourself very quickly. And look around the room and see the others as parts of the whole and be aware of the opening up top and see yourself be aware of yourself standing and looking and see for a moment that which is 
unseen. Thank you all very, very much. Finito. Sorry for going over. Too many stories. <laughs>